to navigating the regulatory waters for aquatic an animals. Um, our public panel, I wanna thank our friends at Lewiston Park for putting this one together for us. Um, now this is a Zoom webinar, not a, um, a Zoom meeting. So if you can't see yourself as an attendee, don't worry, um, that's normal. Um, we'll, use quite, we'll use the Q&A function instead of chat. So if you have a question, um, go ahead and put it in and then we'll get to those at the end. If you are interested in um, getting a CLE credit for this, if you're an attorney, um, a document will be posted in the Q&A um, that will provide more information on that. Um, in the same document, there will also be a process to donate to Friends of Land, Air, Water, which is an organization which um, provides stipends for students doing unpaid public interest environmental law internships. Um, and then just a note on timing, we have a panel um, called Youth Climate Courts right after this one. So we'll end about five minutes um, before um, 1 p.m. So um, everyone has a time to take a break before the next panel. Um, we have five panelists today. Um, first uh, is Professor Kathy Hessler of uh, Lewis and Clark. Um, she'll be providing the background for current U.S. aquatic animal law policy um, and really give us a nice framework um, for the panel going forward. Then um, Diego Plaza of CEDA Chile, uh, who will provide um, his perspective on aquatic animal policy in Chile and the rest of South America. Bianca Atlas of SAFE New Zealand, um, who will provide a New Zealander perspective on aquatic animal law and policy. Um, then Lou Shige of the Institute of Animal Law Asia, who will um, describe what the current state of aquatic animal policy is throughout parts of Asia. And then um, Amy Wilson, also of Lewis and Clark, will finish and um, provide more of a broadly international approach to um, aquatic animal policy. And so go ahead and get started, Professor. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks to all the folks who have organized it and to my co-presenters. We've actually uh, reorganized a little bit, so Lou will go after me and then Bianca, Diego, and Amy. So um, and thanks to all the attendees. We know folks are a little Zoomed out, um, so we appreciate folks attending um, and for all the work and interest. So I want to start um, by noting that we're coming from, I'm coming from Lewis and Clark in Portland, Oregon, where we honor the indigenous people on whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand. And they include the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Balala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. We think it's important to mention that we have much to learn from these communities and um, especially with the urgent need to repair our relationships with the environment and animals. So as Beck said, this panel is designed to do a broad overview of just some aquatic animal legal issues. My focus will be on the animals and their use, animals as property, science, aquaculture in the US legal framework. So the first thing that we need to do is actually see these animals. These are animals who are not as present in our, our environment um, visibly as other animals are. And so that leads to some problems because when we don't see them, we don't really understand them. We don't understand their needs and we don't pay attention to taking care of them. Um, they also exist in uncountable numbers, really, really significant numbers. And as a result, we treat them as an unlimited resource and we discount the value of the individuals who tend to see the species. We tend to see them as useful to the ecosystem and not on their own. So there is a significant need for legal protection and regulation um, re relating to the use and abuse of these animals. And as Amy will talk about later on, alternatives are possible and are growing um, for most of the ways we use these animals. So for food, research, entertainment, medicine, jewelry, and so on. So those alternatives are possible, which make us or should make us reconsider our uses. So who are the animals that we're talking about? Most people tend to think of fin fish, um, also maybe marine mammals, crustaceans, um, maybe mollusks, but we're talking also about obviously the corals, sponges, aquatic birds, aquatic insects and spiders, all of these animals again who we don't tend to recognize as being a part of, uh, of our world. And there are significant differences between all of these species with their biologies, with their capacities, with their welfare needs, and yet we tend to treat them as a clump, right? We treat them all as aquatic animals very often, not all the time. And the law is not bound by the biological realities of these animals. So the, the law treats them as commodities, irregardless of what their biological realities are. 
we know that there are likely more than 2 million marine species and the marine species tend to get a lot more attention than the freshwater species. So we're talking about more types of animals than we have, generally speaking, in the terrestrial world. How do we use these animals? How we use them affects their legal treatment and we use them in ways that we use any other kinds of animals. So we use them as companions or pets for food and fiber, both for human use and other animal use. We see them as wildlife, we see them and use them for entertainment, we use them for work, we see them as invasive or exotic or pest animals, we use them for research, for education and in medicine. And so each of these contexts affects uh, whichever context an animal finds him or herself in affects the legal treatment of that animal. We have significant issues across the spectrum, um, areas of concern including transportation, breeding, slaughter and confinement. Stepping back a moment, animals, all animals, not just aquatic animals, are legally classified as property and that affects everything that we know about them and how we use them. Some jurisdictions have recognized that animals are sentient. Some animals, not all animals, um, differs according to jurisdiction. But even when they recognize that animals are sentient, they're still treated as property. And that includes Oregon, many other um, jurisdictions. There are many efforts underway to address the status of animals, um, to change them from a basic legal property status, but those efforts are still underway. And again, the focus is mostly on terrestrial mammals and then marine mammals and not um, some of the other animals. So let's talk about the science that relates to these animals. So fish feel pain. When I was growing up, most people uh, thought fish did not feel pain. Some scientists still don't <laughs> accept this, but there is uh, both a social now, increasing social consensus, and there is a scientific consensus that fish can feel pain. Um, fish, as well as other aquatic animals, have a myriad of capacities that we don't necessarily recognize. They can feel, they have consciousness, some are self-aware, they can cooperate, they protect one another. Um, they can recognize humans, they have emotional and cogn other cognitive capacities. And the reason this is important, because we are learning about these animals all the time, things that we didn't know about them. So these are just two examples that came out this week. So there was an 81 year old reef fish discovered in Australia. Most folks don't think the reef fish can live that long. And so this affects how we treat them, right? Um, also, cuttlefish pass the Stanford marshmallow test. That's a test where um, usually it's given to children, but in other people, um, you could get a marshmallow right now, or if you wait patiently in a minute or so, you can get two marshmallows, right? So you have a lot of cognitive functioning to understand what the trade-offs are in making that decision. And the cuttlefish uh, pass this test where some human children are not able to pass this test. So we understand more and more, literally weekly, that these animals have cognitive capacities that we did not fully understand before. But we use them, um, so the science is helping us understand them, but the science is also utilizing them. So these are Atlantic horseshoe crabs, which have been used for quite a long time now in vaccine research. Um, these, these are crabs being, uh, the blood is being taken from the crabs and the blood is being used in vaccine research to check for a contaminant. Over half a million of these animals are taken each year just for this purpose alone, which has significant impact obviously on the ecosystem, on these animals themselves. And the sad thing is that synthetic alternatives are available and used widely across the planet, but not here in the US. So when we think about this science, we have to understand that it should tell us we need to start changing our behavior. When the science tells us these animals can feel pain and they have these cognitive capacities, it should require a shift in our approach to these aquatic species. So we can look at the precautionary fish principle. Um, we should look at the fact that we have enough data to change our legal default and assume these animals are sentient and deserving of protections unless proven otherwise. So when science evolves, the law should evolve. Just one quick example is that the Animal Welfare Act was, was designed to help protect warm-blooded animals. And we didn't think that fish were warm-blooded animals. And so the first full, truly warm-blooded fish was discovered just in 2015. And so it's an example of if we set the legal standards as protecting warm-blooded animals, even that definition of who fits in that category of protection is evolving. 
So I'm going to talk really briefly about aquaculture, um, just as an example of how we use aquatic animals, and so then we can talk about the law. So uh, many of you may already know this, but worldwide, um, 178.5 million tons of animals. And again, we don't measure these uses in individual animals, we measure them in millions of tons of animals. So for aquaculture production, um, we have 114 and a half million tons just in um, the last few years, 82.1 million tons of animals, and then we have aquatic algae and then um, ornamental seashells and pearls. And then that's the aquaculture production side. And just for a full picture, um, the wild capture is another 96.4 million tons of animals taken from the oceans, rivers, and lakes every year. Um, so we're talking about a significant percentage of animals who are either bred um, or taken from the wild for human uses. So just the important things here to note are that this we've seen a 527% rise in aquaculture production over the last 30 years. That is phenomenal. And what you should know is that um, countries all over the world, including in the US and states within the US are trying to increase aquaculture production, seeing it as a, a solution to food security, to trade issues, um, to poverty alleviation, all kinds of, uh, these people see a lot of benefits. And so there's a push to increase our culture production even beyond what we have recently seen. So millions and millions and millions of tons of animals more are going to be used in this way. What does it look like? So there are a lot of different systems for aquaculture. Um, so we have ocean systems where the animals are actually in what are sometimes called net pens, um, sometimes in different kinds of ponds within the waterways themselves. We have land-based systems. Sometimes they're really adjacent to waterways. Sometimes they're outdoors. Sometimes they're indoors in fully factory-like settings. The impacts are significant, right? We have significant pollution, especially when they're adjacent to the waterways or in the waterways. We have disease of the animals themselves and if we have escapements, those are obviously significant problems to the wild populations. We have deformity of the animals themselves and these deformities typically cause pain to the animals. We have ecosystem harms and consumer harms. Obviously the pollution we talked about comes from pesticides, antibiotics, pharmaceuticals, the fish waste itself. And here I'm using fish broadly, the animal waste, um, copper sulfide put on the, the nets to keep up algae, dry pellet feed, we could go on. Um, we know that significant percentage of the farmed catfish in the US are contaminated with dioxin. 50% uh, of the farmed cod are deformed. We know that farmed salmon has the highest toxic load of any food tested, that humans living nearby have a higher disease. We have significant worker injury and illness. And we know that we're raising an awful lot of um, animals in captivity and we're feeding them often wild caught animals and sometimes in truly unsustainable numbers. We have some significant welfare questions to address. And so these kinds of questions are similar to the questions raised for terrestrial farmed animals. So crowding, injury, disease, parasites, stress, depression, um, poor diets, um, transportation issues, pharmaceutical issues, on and on. In this area in particular, though this is problematic in how we kill them, there is no federal um, or state regulation in the US mandating that these animals be stunned prior to slaughter. And we have some significantly um, egregious methodologies for killing these animals where they suffer, not just for minutes, but sometimes even hours before they die. And so this is a significant problem to address. Um, I'm not gonna spend time talking about international because my colleagues will be doing that, but I just wanted you to see one facility um, international for aquaculture. And this is again on the rise. Folks are trying to increase the development of these kinds of systems. So this is a, an offshore deep sea fish farm where we're talking about millions and millions, again, of animals killed, produced and killed annually. So what is the legal framework? Um, in the US, there, there are a number of laws we could discuss. The Animal Welfare Act I've mentioned. Um, there are some significant wildlife protections for animals in the wild. Um, and there are some anti-cruelty statutes for animals that would could apply for animals um, 
in, used as companions, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and there's some additional regu regulatory protections. But what I wanna leave you with thinking about from the legal perspective is that most of these statutes have exclusions for aquatic animals. So in the Animal Welfare Act, there's no coverage for animals used for food or research animals, and there's not much coverage for um, aquatic animals. There is some coverage for marine mammals. Uh, wildlife laws don't apply to aquaculture. State anti-cruelty laws mostly exclude either aquatic animals specifically or in the categories of agriculture, fishing, research. Uh, slaughter laws, transportation laws, breeding laws typically don't cover aquatic animals at all. Um, there's some coverage for uh, catfish under the Meat Inspection Act, but nowhere else. So U.S. aquaculture is developing, not as rapidly as some other countries, but it is developing, but in fits and starts. So NOAA has approved two sites for aquaculture development in the Gulf of Mexico and in Southern California, but the Fifth Circuit recently said that NOAA doesn't have the authority uh, to manage aquaculture under the Magnuson-Stevens Act because that regulates fishing and not aquaculture, which is nice. So we now at least have a statement that fishing is fishing, aquaculture is different, and we need a new federal regulatory system to address aquaculture. So the Trump administration um, uh, promulgated an executive order in May supporting aquaculture, and I think in some ways trying to uh, do a little bit of an end run around this ruling. Um, and so I'll talk, um, the Trump administration also did other executive orders, uh, funding for development of aquaculture and COVID-19 supports for those engaged in the industry, also authorized commercial fishing and protecting the marine national monument, specific support for the lobster industry. Um, there are some federal bills pending relating to aquaculture and we'll see where they go. Um, none of them currently have welfare or humane treatment requirements. And by welfare, I mean simply even requiring stunning prior to slaughter. Um, Washington State provides a good example of restricting some ocean aquaculture um, locally within its waters. We can talk about that later if folks are interested. So this is just a little bit more about the executive order from the Trump administration. So it's focusing on removing barriers to aquaculture permitting, um, creating these aquaculture opportunity areas, um, and basically just promoting going faster with fewer um, constraints, I will say. So just a couple of pers additional perspectives um, that we should be thinking about sovereignty, jurisdiction, and traditions of uh, indigenous folks. Um, we need to think about shared resources like water and challenge to access and control of those resources in aquaculture specifically and the wild caught context as well. And just to note that the UN um, has designated 2022, the year of artisanal fishery and aquaculture. So we'll see what they end up doing, but they are paying a little bit more attention in the, uh, at the international level at the UN um, than we are in the US. Um, another perspective to keep in mind is the animal law perspective um, that we need to focus on animal welfare sort of directly, but in concert with sustainability and healthy ecosystems so that we can try to promote as much as we can and harmonize the protection of animals, planet, and the people. Um, so Dr. King said, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and to face the challenge of change. I think this is a useful statement and perspective for many, many things that are going on in the world and our work as well. So our goal is to have healthy oceans with safe um, and protected animals, rivers, lakes as well. Um, so that's what we are working towards. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Lou Shigai, and I'm a law LLM graduate of Lewis and Clark Law School and currently the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia. I'm so honored to speak at this panel today and be part of the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Today I'm going to talk about the major threats to aquatic animals, briefly mention the EU aquaculture and relevant regulations and international regulations in the area of fishing. Fishing is a widespread practice around the world and this issue is especially important to address due to the rules in different maritime zones that have certain limits 
poor management of fish stocks, aquaculture, and overfishing activities are currently making a lot of species of aquatic animals become vulnerable and being threatened with extinction. Besides, um, catching certain species of aquatic animals causes the disappearance of other aquatic animals due to their dependence on one another in the food chain. The Food and Agricultural Organization estimated that in 2000, the total world capture of fish was 86 million tons and the top producing countries were mainly in China, Peru, Japan, United States, Chile, Russia, India, Thailand, Iceland, Norway, and Indonesia. Um, oceans cover 70% of Earth and roughly 5% of them have been explored. The report of the Living Blue Planet in 2015 stated that the size of the marine population has declined by 49% between 1970 and 2012 due to overfishing activities, illegal activities, and climate change. Northern areas of Earth are mostly affected by climate change because of global warming. For instance, the Arctic is considered on the front lines of climate change. Over the last 200 years, the waters of Earth absorbed more than 150 billion metric tons of carbon because of human activities. It was estimated that carbon dioxide concentrations are now higher than at any time in the last 800,000 years. <clears throat> Among other threats is the aquaculture industry raising fish for commercial purposes, which impacts fish population. If not properly designed and monitored, aquaculture may significantly affect the environment. Species that are commonly um, raised on farms are salmon, carp, tilapia, catfish, and trout. The European Union, for instance, in its Treaty of Lisbon, recognizes animals as, as sentient beings and provides that the member states shall pay full regard to the welfare requirements of animals. The EU remains the leading consumer of seafood, followed by the United States and Japan. And the main <clears throat> aquaculture products in the EU are marine aquaculture, shellfish aquaculture, and freshwater production. In the EU, um, uh, in the field of aquaculture and its products, um, EU has Consul Directive of 2006, uh, which focuses on animal health requirements for aquaculture animals and on the prevention and control of certain diseases. This directive is um, applied to fish, mollusks, and crustaceans at all their life stages, where it, um, in a farm or a mollusk farming area, including any aquatic animal from the wild intended for a farm or mollusk farming area. <clears throat> Farmed animals in Consul Directive concerning the protection of animals kept for farming purposes includes fish for the purposes of this directive. The definition of an animal is stated as any animal including fish, reptiles, or amphibians bred or kept for the production of food, skin, wool, fur, or other farming purposes. Um, fishing activities affect animals and the environment and lead to the reduction of species living in the wild. The regulation of the fish population and establishing the conservation of species requires international cooperation. Some international conventions were adopted to fulfill this purpose and to provide that fish stocks shall be managed by countries. There is also the customer law rule, which is binding on all states unless it expresses persistent objection in time. Customer law to be bound on all states should have two elements, which are state practice and opinion juris. There have also been some principles of custom in the field of fisheries regulation, which are obligation to ensure the conservation of the living resources when exercising the right of freedom of fishing on the high seas, establishing an exclusive economic zone, exercising effective control over flag vessels, port states jurisdiction over vessels in their ports, and right to hot pursuit, uh, which is the right of a coastal state to pursue onto the high seas a vessel that has violated its laws in its waters, thus preventing the offending vessel from escaping the punishment by attempting to hide behind the right of free navigation, which is designed to protect innocent vessels. The first instrument uh, that are important to mention are of course Geneva Conventions. Um, these are the Convention on the Territorial Sea in the Contiguous Zone, the Convention on the High Seas, the Convention on Fishing and Conservation of the Living Resources of the High Seas, and the Convention on the Continental Shelf. While only 
one of them is focused on conserving living resources. Other treaties also have some provisions dedicated to fisheries regulations. For example, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, although it is not an animal focused treaty, it helps understand the rights and duties in certain maritime zones. Any waters start with the territorial waters. It goes, goes further to the contiguous zone, the exclusive economic zone and high seas. UN clause provides general duties of countries to protect and preserve the marine environment in the maritime zones and high seas areas. And it is also considered a customer law. The breadth of the territorial waters is 12 nautical miles from the baseline and only the coastal state has the authority over this maritime zone. Beyond this area in the contiguous zone, which is up to 24 nautical miles, um, the coastal state would have limited rights that are balanced with other states. The exclusive economic zone that goes after is up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline and all states shall have due regard to the rights and duties of the coastal state and shall comply with the laws and regulations adopted by the coastal state in accordance with the UN clause provisions. In the high seas, the area that doesn't belong to, to any jurisdiction and where problems of fishing occur most of the time, states have um, exclusive authority over vessels flying their flag or otherwise registered in their state. Also, Article 64 provides that the nationals fish in the regions for highly migratory species that are listed in Annex 1 shall cooperate directly or through appropriate international organizations with a view to ensuring the conservation and promoting the objective of optimum utilization of such species throughout the region. Um, the Stradlin's Fish Stocks Agreement fills the gap left by UN clause and provides obligations for states regarding fishing outside the exclusive economic zone of any coastal state. It also provides that coastal states shall conduct cooperative mechanisms with Australian stocks and highly migratory species within their exclusive economic zone. The objective of the agreement is to ensure the long-term conservation and sustainable use of Australian fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks. With regard to the definition of a fish, it states that a fish includes mollusks and crustaceans. The agreement doesn't encourage flag states to authorize vessels for fishing activities operating on the high seas unless they're members of a certain regional fisheries management organization. If a state is a member of the regional fisheries management organization, it is obliged to adopt and apply international minimum standards for the responsible fisheries and establish appropriate cooperative mechanisms for effective control, surveillance and enforcement. It is also possible to inspect certain vessels that violate the provision of the agreement. Um, in this case, a state can board and inspect the vessel violator flag to another state. The flag state becomes responsible for the process of prosecuting, monitoring, and enforcing provisions of the agreement with regard to conservation and management of living resources. Another instrument is the Convention on Fishing and Conservation of Living Resources of the High Seas. This um, treaty was adopted to resolve the issues of the conservation of living resources um, in the high seas through international cooperation. The provisions on the conservation of living resources in the high seas, according to the convention, means the aggregate um, of the measures rendering possible the optimum sustainable yield from those resources so as to secure a maximum supply of food and other marine products. The convention also regulates the issue when for example, two or more countries are engaged in the same fishing stocks or other marine, uh, living marine resources in any area or high seas areas. Um, in this case, they shall enter into negotiations with a view to prescribing by agreement for their nationals the necessary measures for the uh, protection and conservation of the living resources affected. Um, I personally think that this is an important treaty because most of the time the high seas areas are left with no proper consideration due to freedom of navigation therein. <clears throat> the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources is another international instrument that aims to preserve mar marine life and environmental integrity in and near Antarctica. The convention was adapted as a multilateral response to concerns that unregulated increases in krill catches in the 
Southern Ocean could be detrimental for Antarctic marine ecosystems, um, in particular for seabirds, seals, whales, and fish that depend on krill. It covers several marine protected areas and provides that contracting parties, whether they're parties to the treaty or not, shall comply with the provisions prescribed by the convention. It also states that the contracting parties, which are not parties to the convention, um, acknowledge the special obligations and responsibilities of the um, Antarctic Treaty consultative parties for the protection and preservation of the environment of the area covered by the um, Antarctic Treaty. <clears throat> uh, the area that the convention covers um, applies to the area south of um, 60 degrees south latitude and to the Antarctic marine living resources of the area between that latitude and the Antarctic convergence. The last treaty that I'm going to talk about is the agreement on port state measures to prevent, deter, and eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Um, it provides that fishing vessels shall have permission to dock at a port and um, they're obliged to notify the board about the details of their fishing operations. The dock keeps the right to deny the permission if unregulating fishing occurs by the fishing vessel requesting the permit. The treaty also includes the provisions on inspect inspecting equipment, um, vessel sketches, and records. There are several cases concerning fisheries brought to the International Court of Justice, for example, the Southern Bluefin Tuna case where the establishment of an arbitral tribunal under Annex 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention was requested by Australia and New Zealand concerning the conservation and management of Southern Bluefin Tuna. Pending the constitution of this tribunal, Australia and New Zealand requested the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea to prescribe provisional measures, including the immediate cessation of Japan's experimental fishing program. The tribunal, upon hearing the parties, prescribed four provisional measures. Um, eventually, the tribun um, arbitral tribunal decided that it lacked jurisdiction to rule on the merits of the dispute, and it also revoked the provisional measures prescribed by IT laws. <clears throat> Other cases are the United Kingdom versus Iceland and the Federal Republic of Germany versus Iceland that were brought by the UK and the Federal Republic of Germany following an extension by Iceland of its exclusive fisheries jurisdiction from a distance of 12 to 50 nautical miles and the prohibition of all foreign fishing activities therein. The ICJ found that the Icelandic regulations on the unilateral extension of exclusive um, fishing rights to a limit of uh, 50 nautical miles were not opposable to either the UK or the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, the, court, the court also found that um, Iceland was not entitled to unilaterally exclude the British and German fishing vessels from the disputed areas. Um, finally, the court ruled that the parties were under a mutual obligation to um, enter into negotiations for an equitable solution of the dispute relating to the apportionment of the fishery resources considering the preferential rights of Iceland, the established rights of the UK and um, the Federal Republic of Germany and any interest of other states. Um, climate change and uh, major human activities such as fishing and aquaculture affect the um, animals population and the environment. To protect and preserve the marine species and marine environment, it is uh, important to take the necessary steps to prevent the population of animals from going extinct or be on the edge of extinction or um, being threatened with extinction. Um, international law is a good source to inspect, monitor, and govern the maritime zones, but international cooperation is necessary to achieve this goal. Illegal activities or non-compliance with the obligations of a certain treaty or customer law unfortunately still a cure, uh, so it becomes important for countries to pay more attention to the activities that they and other countries exercise in the waters. Thank you.
Good morning. I'm Bianca Atlas, a lawyer in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a 2020 graduate of Lewis and Clark's Animal Law Programme. It's an honour to be presenting with my colleagues today. Thank you for the opportunity to participate and to connect with everyone from the other side of the world. I'd like to start with a whakatauki or Māori proverb. Ke naro na taonga o te tūroa, pera i te naro o te moa. Lest the treasures of the natural world be lost, as the moa was lost. For millions of years, the large flightless bird, the moa, thrived in New Zealand. They were hunted to extinction about 600 years ago. New Zealand was one of the last habitable land masses to be settled by humans, with humans first arriving in the late 13th century. Since then, New Zealand's vertebrate fauna has been nearly halved. There have been uncounted losses of invertebrates and several species of plants and fungi are, are now extinct. All of this is due in large part to anthropogenic factors. A 2019 article by Luis Valente and others in Current Biology estimated that it would take around 50 million years to recover the number of bird species lost since humans first colonized New Zealand. The authors said, the conservation decisions we make today will have repercussions for millions of years to come. The biodiversity observed today is the result of millions of years of evolutionary time. This whakatauki or Māori proverb encapsulates, among other things, the consequences when we fail to interact with other species in a way that is balanced, respectful and sustainable. And it reminds us to learn from the past. With that, today I'm going to provide a very quick snapshot of selected issues relating to New Zealand's aquatic animals. I'll provide an overview of New Zealand's aquatic ecosystems, the legal regulatory context and an Indigenous Māori perspective. And I'll then talk very briefly about aquaculture in New Zealand. Described as an ancient life raft, largely isolated for millions of years, New Zealand is a biodiversity hotspot. The exclusive economic zone covers over 4 million square kilometres or 1.5 million square miles, 15 times larger than the land area, and it spans subtropical to subantarctic waters. It is estimated that as much as 85% of New Zealand's wildlife may be found in the ocean, and the distinctive combinations of climate, geology and landforms resulted in highly diverse freshwater and marine ecosystems. This slide shows the proportion of New Zealand's indigenous species that are found nowhere else on earth. These figures don't include extinct species and the figures are likely to be higher given that a large proportion of the remainder is either unknown or unspecified. Threats to aquatic animals and their habitats in New Zealand are similar to those in other countries. Te mana o te tao, or the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy 2020 identified five pressures related to human activity that are threatening New Zealand's biodiversity. Their impacts are complex and different for each ecosystem. Firstly, direct exploitation, primarily fishing or overfishing, and its wider impacts, including bycatch, which kills hundreds of seabirds, marine mammals, non-commercial fish species, and uncounted communities of marine invertebrates. Secondly, pollution. Excessive leaching of nutrients, for example, from fertilizers and effluent from farmed animals into waterways and estuaries is a huge problem in New Zealand. Causes infestation of aquatic weeds, algal blooms and other problems. Plastic pollution is also a major issue in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Thirdly, climate change. O ocean acidification and food web changes as a result of climate change, among other issues, pose a major threat to all aquatic life. Fourthly, introduced invasive species. So for an example, invasive marine seaweed crowds out indigenous species. In freshwater, game fish such as trout prey on indigenous fish and invertebrates, and some also feed on aquatic plants, which can degrade water quality. And fifthly, changes in land or water use. So decades of drainage and conversion to intensive production land uses has resulted in the losses of wetlands and other ecosystems. So the impact, around 1 in 14 indigenous species are now threatened with extinction. And the image um, at the bottom is a devastating image of four Maui dolphins who washed up in a recreational set net. These are the smallest and one of the rarest dolphin in the world, found only on the west coast of the North Island, 
it's estimated that there are only 63, possibly fewer of them left. There's a raft of legislation that contributes to protecting aquatic animals and their habitats. I'll just outline a selection of the key ones. The Wildlife Act provides for the protection of wildlife, except for certain species named in schedules to the Act. It also provides for the control of wildlife. Recent amendments include the protection of several marine groups, including black and red corals. The Marine Mammals Protection Act protects all seals, whales and dolphins, absolutely and prohibits the holding of any marine mammal in captivity. The Fisheries Act gives commercial, customary and recreational fisheries access to resources while ensuring fish stocks are managed sustainably. And the Marine Reserves Act. This is the main legislation for the protection of marine biodiversity. It establishes marine reserves, the primary focus of which is scientific study and the preservation of marine life. So what are the limitations? Well, these laws only protect animals within New Zealand's EEZ. Many migratory species, for example, seabirds, um, such as albatross and petrels, spend the majority of their lives in international waters. This underscores the importance of international conventions and global co collaboration, as um, my colleague mentioned. Indeed, many marine species are protected as a result of obligations arising from New Zealand being a signatory to conventions such as CITES, the International Convention for the Regulation of Whaling, and the Convention on Migratory Species. Despite the dire statistics about global biodiversity loss that we've heard and warnings that we're on the verge of Earth's sixth mass extinction, our anthropocentric utility-based worldview really does prevail. We predominantly frame nature as a resource, separate from us, for our use, this instrumental view of nature, combined with the deeply entrenched property status of animals, leads quite naturally to the view that, that humans are distinct from, from and infinitely superior to all forms of non-human animal life. In contrast, Te Ao Māori, or the Māori worldview, central to which is the interconnectedness of all beings, opens the door to a paradigm that recognises the intrinsic value of animals and reframes how humans interact with other species. Traditionally, Māori believe there is a deep kinship between humans and the natural world, whereby all life, including plants, animals, humans, the land, sky, and water, is connected and shares whakapapa, or common ancestry or genealogy, from the union of Ranganui, the sky father, and Papatuanuku, the earth mother, all a part of a unified whole. Kaitiakitanga arises from this kin relationship. This is the obligation to care for and nurture people and the natural world, to act respectfully towards ancestors and also towards future generations. Kaitiakitanga includes the preservation, replenishment and sustainability of the physical environment, but it also has a spiritual aspect, an obligation to nurture and care for Māori or the elemental life force or spiritual essence of a person, place or thing. Kaitiakitanga is actually acknowledged in um, some of our environmental legislation, such as the Resource Management Act and the Fisheries Act. However, there are concerns that these statutory definitions don't really capture the essence of kaitiakitanga. For example, in framing kaitiakitanga as a human function, these definitions fail to recognize the central role of non-human species and the reciprocal nature of kaitiakitanga. This is inherent to the Māori worldview. These differences between the Māori and European conceptualizations highlight the fundamental shift that is needed in the way that we regard and relate to animals and the environment. If we are to preserve the integrity of concepts like kaitiakitanga, one could argue that nothing short of a paradigm shift is needed in the way we view our position in the world in relation to other species. And I think this is something that's needed with increasing urgency. So shifting gears a little now, I'd like to provide a brief overview of aquaculture in New Zealand. So aquaculture has had a long history in New Zealand, having been undertaken by Māori for centuries. However, the, cent the country's modern commercial scale aquaculture wasn't established until the late 1960s. While many species have been trialled, the current industry is dominated by just three species, the indigenous green-lipped mussel, the introduced Pacific oyster, and Chinook or King Salmon, which was introduced from Northern California, originally for game fishing. 
mirroring global trends, aquaculture is New Zealand's fastest growing food production sector. There are aspirations for aquaculture to be a three billion New Zealand dollar industry by 2035. The next frontier that we're looking at is open ocean farming. And in July, 2019, New Zealand King Salmon, which is our largest salmon producer, lodged a 35 year resource consent application for what could be, and what they certainly are hoping will be New Zealand's first open ocean fish farm. This will be on a 1,792 hectare site in the Cook Strait, which is between the North and South Islands. COVID-19 and opposition to the project have delayed progress um, so far. So New Zealand has a long history of regulatory changes affecting aquaculture. The most recent reforms in 2011 were designed among other things to free up marine space for marine, for marine farming, simplify the approval process for marine farms and provide, promote investment in aquaculture development. Marine aquaculture is managed primarily under the Resource Management Act um, and the RMA or Resource Management Act is currently being reformed and will likely be replaced by three new acts. Land-based aquaculture on the other hand is managed um, through the freshwater fish farming regulations under the Fisheries Act. Under these regulations, farmers must have a fish license, fish farm license granted by Fisheries New Zealand to farm certain species. So important thing to note about all these, um, the legislation and regulations controlling aquaculture is that they're firmly focused on environmental concerns. There's no explicit reference to the humane treatment and welfare of individual animals. Some provisions may offer indirect animal welfare benefits while attempting to mitigate potential negative ecological impacts, but any of these animal welfare benefits really are just incidental. And further, where they exist, any aquaculture industry and codes are largely unenforceable and reliant on self-regulation. As has been well observed in other activities involving animals, self-regulation by industry is generally highly ineffective in pro protecting and promoting animal welfare. Professor Hessler has traversed the welfare and environmental issues in aquaculture, so I won't linger on this slide, but just to note that it's fair to say not a lot is known about the conditions and practices on salmon farms in New Zealand. The industry invests, <clears throat> invests heavily in marketing to international consumers, showing farming operations as pristine and sustainable. <clears throat> Overseas undercover investigations have revealed a much darker, unhealthier, inhumane reality. And I think we can expect increasing, increasing pressure for greater transparency in this, in this industry in New Zealand. Until recently, farmed fish have received comparatively little attention, even from animal advocates. With the exponential growth of aquaculture globally and increasing scientific evidence of fish sentience, the importance of good welfare for farmed fish has really gained prominence recently. Given the evidence which Professor Hessler touched on of fish sentience, it is becoming increasingly difficult to justify withholding from fish the legal protections that other vertebrates and terrestrial farmed animals have. And in terms of the precautionary principle, it could be argued that even where the question of fish sentience has not been conclusively resolved, and this could apply to other species as well, such as bivalves, they should be given the benefit of the doubt. As Wadiwal from the University of Sydney states, until we have confirmation that fish do not suffer, it seems reckless to expose fish to injury that we already know would induce severe suffering if applied in a similar way <clears throat> to other animals whose capacity to feel pain we already recognize. Such an approach is appropriate in the context of aquaculture where there is potential for suffering on such an immense scale. I've included this slide with um, Carl Safina's poignant observation of salmon on a farm. I think this really encapsulates the conundrum of farming salmon and indeed farming any animal. The fundamental question arises of whether an animal's need, needs can ever be met in an intensive farming operation. For a migratory species such as Chinook salmon, which is the only fish that we farm in New Zealand, we really do have to ask ourselves, whether their behavioural and other needs will ever be met in what is essentially an aquatic factory farm. And just quickly to um, cover off the um, animal welfare legislation that could um, potentially protect fish in aquaculture. 
So the Animal Welfare Act is the primary legislation governing animal welfare. The positives are that the definition of animal is a lot more expansive than in the US. So it does um, include a long list of animals, including fish, reptiles, amphibians, octopus, squid, crabs, lobsters, and crayfish. It also recognized that animals are sentient um, and arguably the most important innovation of the current act, which was introduced through a, an amendment in 2015, is that it imposes a positive duty of care on all owners and all persons in charge of animals to attend properly to their welfare. So there would actually be potential to take a prosecution under the act if animals were being mistreated on um, in aquaculture. However, I'd expect that evidenti evidentiary difficulties would make that a huge challenge. Animal welfare regulations um, and codes of welfare are delegated or secondary legislation that's under the Act. Um, there's been one regulation issued in relation to crustaceans, but none issued for fish. And I would argue that serious consideration should be given to issuing regulations relating specifically to farmed fish, as this could potentially help um, enforce requirements that um, the Animal Welfare Act prescribes. And in terms of codes of welfare, um, codes have been issued for many terrestrial animals covering a range of species and activities. There's no code for aquaculture or for fish or indeed for any aquatic animal. There's two existing codes, the Code of Welfare for uh, slaughter, Commercial Slaughter and the Code of Welfare for Transport within New Zealand. These do touch on uh, fish and have some application to fish and aquaculture. However, both these codes suffer from the same fundamental, same fundamental flaw. They're heavily focused on terrestrial animals and they give aquatic animals only cursory consideration. So I'd just like to uh, round off my presentation with another um, whakatauki or Māori proverb. He kaitiaki na tangata o te aotūroa a ko te aotūroa he kaitiaki o na tangata. The people are guardians of the natural world and the natural world is a guardian of the people. This wisdom reminds us of the interconnectedness of all beings. It provides hope that in rethinking the impacts of our food production systems and the way we treat animals in these systems, we have an opportunity to reframe our relationships with other species, an opportunity to protect and replenish biodiversity, and an opportunity to support the manifestation of kaitiaki tanga. Thanks so much for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Diego Plaza. Uh, I'm a Chilean lawyer, Animal Law LLM from Lewis and Clark, and Executive Director of the Center for Chilean Animal Law Studies here at Chile. So today I will be talking about some environmental issues in the exploitation of aquatic animals and fluvial water courses in Chile. So I will start talking a little bit about fisheries, then I will talk about the aquaculture situation in my country, and after that, uh, about the production of hydroelectric power. So, um, the dynamics known as the capture of the state by economic power groups or the corporate colonization of politics show us how the wealthy minorities of societies, currently called super rich, manipulate representatives of public authority at their convenience. In Chile, an emblematic case that exemplifies this process has occurred with the pitching law and the bribes made by different industrial groups to various politicians, as has happened with the Northern Fishing Corporation Corpesca, the Association of Fishing Industrialists, ACIPES, among others. Basically, uh, these corporations bribed several congressmen to the extent to sending them emails with express instructions on how to vote in, in the Congress on, or how to answer interviews. And the outcome of this enormous fiasco in Chile was the creation of the uh, Fisheries and Aquaculture Law from 2013, also uh, known as the uh, Longueira Law. Um, this, um, due to the name of the Minister of Economy who promoted this rule, uh, Mr. Pablo Longueira. Um, this law imposed adverse changes in the economy, the environment, and on non human animals. For example, some of them are the following. The law established more restrictions for small fishermen than for large industry, preventing smaller vessels from fishing in another region, unlike what happened with large fishing vessels. 
uh, large industries pay only for the licenses of their pitching fees and not for the volume pitch, which means that artisanal fishermen can pay uh, proportionally more than large industries. Uh, also, it forces artisanal fishermen to share their fishing grounds with industrial fishermen uh, and does not include the recommendations to extend the five mile exclusion zone for pitching vessels, these five miles from the coast. Uh, we're using the catch area for marine products to one mile and giving the first five miles, which are extremely rich in animals, to industrial pitching, devastating uh, the country's marine ecosystems. But this is this may be the most interesting uh, thing about this law that this law established uh, formally that pitching rights of large industry were granted in perpetuity and could be even inheritable. Uh, currently, the law grants pitching rights in concession for 20 years under the pretext of being able to ensure the investment, an investment that was being made um, so since long ago. And the outcome of this rule was that the distribution of the pitching quotas finally benefited seven super rich families with the free expropriation of Chile's pitching resources. And these families have recently merged into three large conglomerates. Um, Cherry, uh, controlling the 76% of the country's industrial pitching capacity and sharing profits calculated in at least $3 billion per year from the free extraction of Chile's marine resources. You can see in this image um, how uh, the sea was distributed uh, prior to the Longueira law. You can see a legend here, Chile and sea, but now uh, after the Longueira law, the, the Longueira law, you can see the Angelini sea, the Santa Cruz seas, the Stengel seas, the Izquierdo sea, and all these families is because of their fishing rights uh, over those areas in, of the country. Um, according to some official data, particularly according to a state of the situation of the main Chilean fisheries uh, created by the Undersecretary of Fisheries, one of the main administrations in the area, uh, the establishment of this system resulted in the intensification of the devastation of Chilean fisheries and marine ecosystems. So in, in the graphic uh, of your left, uh, we can see a gradual decrease in landings caused by the abrupt decrease in marine biomass and due to a prolongation of the critical state of overexploitation of various hydrobiological resources, which is all boosted up by the fishing methods uh, commonly used for industrial purposes in Chile, such as bottom trawling. Fortunately, during the year 2020, a bill was introduced declaring the Longueira law as undeniably new and void, which was a, a huge milestone in, in Chile. And this based on the idea that the constitutional principle of property was violated in the parliamentary discussion process, uh, which was pretty obvious. Today, um, the bill annulling the Longueira law is in its first constitutional procedure and has already been approved by the Chamber of Deputies. Although there are still several uh, steps left in its approval process, this, in my opinion, may seem uh, or may represent a glimmer of hope that will eventually allow us to reduce the degree of exploitation that we currently exert on the environment and on billions of lives of non-human animals. Is this a happy ending? We don't know yet. I will let you know soon. So regarding aquaculture, I know that Katie and Bianca has have already talked about uh, animal welfare issues and environmental impacts of aquaculture, but I will just limit my speech uh, to try to involve those issues that affect my country um, as an example of, of, of South America, right? So basically, uh, the Chilean aquaculture was non-existent in the 70s, reached an extraordinary development during the 90s, this due to a spectacular growth of salmon aquaculture, According to some uh, recently World Bank data, data, Chile ranks 11th in the world agriculture production and is the second largest salmon producer after Norway. So basically, salmon is the main product of this industry in Chile and uh, obviously is the main victim uh, of this activity. And yes, so what is the law regulating this activity? Uh, as we said before, the Longueira law since is the law regulating the fisheries and the aquaculture activity. So regarding the environment and animal welfare, specifically first regarding the environment, according to a third environmental court of Albivia, uh, on a ruling on seafood against the executive director of the Environmental Evaluation Service, uh, this court stated that the Longueira law is completely oriented to the conservation and sustainable use of marine resources and ecosystems. Um, 
which uh, means that the Longueira law has a very important environmental end, supposedly. On the other hand, according to regarding animal welfare, sorry, uh, it's very important. It's Article 13 F, which states that aquaculture shall provide for rules that protect animal welfare and procedures that avoid unnecessary suffering. While this article may seem as a sort of an avant-garde article compared to other legal systems, it, it, it has many shortcomings. For example, it's difficult to determine uh, who has this duty uh, to provide for rules. It may seem that it's a state uh, or the agencies, but it's really difficult to force the state to provide for these rules, right? And also the, the concept of unnecessary suffering. What is unnecessary in this context? Uh, if we take into account that this article exists on a law that regulates the exploitation of non-human animals, on a law that regulates the exercise of this industrial activity, uh, we may understand suddenly that uh, many kinds of suffering will be considered necessary. However, um, this sort of legal poetry regarding the protection of the environment and animal welfare contrasts with reality. Uh, the reality is that we have many, many issues, uh, environmental issues and animal welfare issues in Chile. Uh, for example, regarding carrying capacity and pitch biomass. Historically in Chile, uh, few assessments of carrying capacity at cage, farm or fjord scales have been conducted. In this regard, there is an increasing need for a sound productive carrying capacity estimation tool in order to establish the maximum number of feet that can be supported by a specific area and or relevant water body without causing unacceptable changes in ecosystems. And moreover, these very few assessments have been used neither by the government nor by the private sector to limit maximum pitch biomass per area, which is essential and crucial in order to prevent from overcrowding conditions which affects animal welfare. Maybe one of the uh, toughest uh, issues we, we face in Chile in this industry is the use of antibiotics, because in Chile, there are no links for the use of antibiotics in the control of fish diseases. The only existing controls in this regard review the presence of antibiotic residues only in the final product, in the marketable fish, but not in the aquatic environment intervened by this activity. So, putting this data into perspective, According to an Oceana report from 2018, Chilean salmon farmers are using up to 950 grams of antibiotics to raise one ton of feet, while Norway, for example, uses just 0.17 grams, this compared to almost a kilogram uh, per ton. And so according to some authorized voices, this has allowed the development of antibiotic resistant bacteria in sediments and there is also uh, an important concern that salmon uh, aquaculture has the potential to increase the proportion of antimicrobial resistant bacteria to antibiotics that we are currently use on humans. And well, we have many other issues. Uh, we don't have enough time to do them all sadly, but for example, the state of salmon, salmon in Chile are an exotic and an invasive species that compete with endemic species, are predators. And uh, according to some estimates, uh, more than 900,000 salmon escape annually from uh, salmon farms in Chile, which also poses a threat for human health, since humans uh, try to catch these fish for eat them, and they are full of uh, antibiotics, which are uh, very toxic for human health. And we have many, many other problems, uh, for example, the eutrophication of the coastal and marine environments, the harmful interactions, uh, between farms and wild animals, the fish and fish fed, uh, among others. We still have a lot of uh, work to do in this industry. And yes, finally, I will talk a little bit about hydroelectric power in Chile. In Chile, hydropower is an important energy source for the country's operation. This energy is obtained by intervening in water resources and can take different forms such as dam power plants, runoff river power plants, and pumped storage plants. To appreciate the relevance of this energy source in Chile, we must take into consideration that the Chilean electricity market is composed of three independent systems, two of which are fed by hydraulic energy. For example, regarding the national electric system, 27% of its installed capacity corresponds to hydraulic energy, while regarding the ISEN system, 37%. Uh, in conclusion, we have more than 60 hydroelectric plants uh, around the country, and 
for many people, this may be a really green or clean uh, energy source, but the truth is it has many adverse effects on the environment and on non-human animals. And maybe the most significant deterioration here occurs during the construction phase, uh, not only because it occupies the site where the plant itself will be located, but also because it invades a much larger territory. This due to the fact that temporary constructions are required uh, uh, usually. And moreover, during this stage, the air is polluted, uh, heavy machinery produces a lot of noise, the vegetation is cleared, and numerous, numerous species habitat are destroyed. Uh, however, maybe in damp power plants, the impact is even bigger, this due to the deterioration of the landscape and several other externalities. For example, uh, some of them affect the population being the floating area. Uh, similarly, ecosystems, archaeological sites, and heritage sites are affected. And according to some recent studies, um, the rotting vegetation is in, this, in the water indicates that dams are responsible for the emission of almost 1 billion tons of greenhouse gases each year, which globally represents about 1.3% of the world human uh, generated emissions. Besides the above, maybe one of the most conflicting situations in this regard is the loss of flora and fauna affected during the filling of the reservoir, including small mammals, reptiles, insects, and native flora, some of which are in a fragile state of conservation. Um, however, uh, we have many problems that we have not been solved yet in Chile. For example, what happens to the fish that used to live in the watercourse on which the reservoir is being built? For the moment, and there is no consensus or proof of effectiveness at the local level regarding the so-called pitch ladders. And in fact, it has even been warned that installing pitch ladders without biological criteria or specific analysis of critical habitats and local population dynamics um, may end up compromising the conservation of pitch fauna, becoming, becoming an ecological trap rather than a solution. And just, I just want to finish my presentation, uh, but by highlighting uh, how important is the environmental and animal activism in this regard. Uh, fortunately, uh, citizen demonstration and mobilization and animal and environmental activism in Chile at least have managed to stop some projects that would have had high reversible impacts on animal dignity and the environment. The perfect the perfect example of this is the case of the Idraisen project, which finally did not prosper thanks to a lengthy legal and media battle, which led to its cancellation in 2017. This project contemplated the construction and operation of five hydroelectric power plants, two on the Baker River and three on the Pascua River, located in the Isin region in southern Chile. And this project would have flowed almost 6,000 hectares of natural reserves, would have affected six national parks, 11 national reserves, 26 priority conservation sites, 16 wetlands, 32 private protected areas, besides six Mapuche communities. So uh, yes, I think it's pretty important for us to engage in this kind of activism regarding the environment and animal welfare, because we can uh, make huge changes for the lives of many, many human and non-human animals. Thank you very much. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today, albeit virtually, with all of you and my wonderful colleagues. Um, a big thank you to the organizers of this conference for having us and for putting this all together. I'm Amy P. Wilson, and I'm currently working with Professor Hessler at the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative at Lewis and Clark Law School, and I'm also Director of Animal Law Reform South Africa. So as a regulatory uh, attorney navigating these waters, it can be not only extremely cha challenging, but also very frustrating. And my co panelists have done an excellent job of highlighting these various challenges. And I think what perhaps is a bit uh, obvious at this stage is no matter where on planet Earth you are, a lot of these problems are the same and they keep arising in the same contexts. So today, I, this is briefly what I want to cover. I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough time, so I might zip through it. But if I don't get to any of it, I'd be happy to engage with you afterwards. 
But the main and key takeaways that I would like to leave you with is a couple of these here. Uh, the first is that we are continuing to promote an increased utilization of aquatic animals across the globe, whether these are farmed or wild animals. And we see this consistently throughout. We refer to them as resources. And then we do this under the guise of sustainability. And this sustainability is captured within our legal systems. And we need to consider whether this is in fact being achieved, this term of sustainability. The second is that our regulatory systems and our legal systems are inadequate at providing the protection that not only the aquatic animals themselves deserve, but we as human animals and of course the environment. Also wanted to highlight this hypocrisy that we live with, that we protect certain animals or we deem certain animals worthy of protection, and even then only in certain contexts, and then others we don't. And you see that quite clearly in some of the examples that I'm going to discuss. The force is that our scientific understanding and the developments are continuously happening, but our law and our policy is not actually keeping up with those developments. Uh, and that is obviously very problematic. And the fifth is that there are alternatives and other solutions out there to much of our utilization of not only aquatic animals, but the natural world. And these are increasing exponentially all the time, but these are often being met with other barriers, legal barriers, as well as social and economic barriers. So it's important that we actually promote these alternatives. And uh, coming from an aquatic animal law and animal law perspective is that uh, these are in fact the largest group of victims or beings that are being utilized and killed on planet Earth. So we must acknowledge that throughout all of this. And this obviously has an impact on us as humans and our Earth. But their protection is an issue of major public concern. And we need to ensure that our legal and regulatory systems uh, ensure their protection. And we cannot simply do this from an environmental law perspective, because we've seen that this anthropocentric framing of our laws thus far has not actually protected us uh, to the extent that we needed to. So this is just a little bit of uh, light humor before I get into some of the not so light stuff. Um, my father used to say this to me when I had some bad relationships growing up. Uh, there's plenty of fish in the sea and I think maybe perhaps uh, that's not the case anymore and we should stop trying to use that to console people because maybe it's not having the desired effect. Uh, why is that the case? Well, I think many people still have an image in their heads of wild caught fishing being like this, and perhaps not all of you that are on the call on the meeting today, but uh, many people I know and a large portion of the population does in fact still see fishing happening in this context, when in fact it's happening more on this scale with these huge trawlers. Uh, and this is, you can just see the number of animals that are being uh, contained just in that singular net in the singular ship. And this is not uncommon. Here's another example of these super trawlers. Uh, nets can be as big as 13 jumbo jets. And we've spoken a little bit about overfishing and how it's a huge threat to our oceans. But uh, importantly, and as Professor Hessler mentioned, we have this increasing push in our legal systems to continue to, to promote these industries. So as recently as last year, uh, Donald Trump was saying we need to promote these industries. And of course, there's an interest in promoting a domestic industry over exporting and importing products from other countries. Um, but by doing so, are we not actually causing other harms? I wanted to touch a little bit on bycatch. We've uh, spoken about this in the panel. Uh, estimates range from as much as 10 to 40% of everything that is caught being bycatch. I mean, those are huge figures. Those are staggering. And it's not just, um, you know, turtles, as we see, it's aquatic birds, it's cetaceans, and so many other animal lives are impacted by this. And just a recent example of how the law is dealing with this was uh, a couple of days ago, uh, it, the National Marine Fishery Services published this rule for consideration to remove restrictions on incidental catching of squids and sculpins, uh, pre currently limited to be used for fish meal only, to actually expand the usage of them. So the intention behind this is obviously to prevent wastage, because obviously if they are being incidentally caught, they shouldn't only be processed as the word for one specific use. Uh, but again, are we not creating other um, perhaps uh, unintended consequences by saying, well, we can actually use these animals for a broader purpose, even if we incidentally catch them? And is that not then promoting uh, subsequent industries? So I think just considering all the time that these legal actions have knock-on effects. Uh, and when we're trying to solve potentially one problem, we might be creating uh, various others. And you'll see that in some of the other examples that I'm going to touch on. 
Briefly, habitats and protection. Of course, we cannot talk about protecting aquatic animals without protecting their habitats. And uh, the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity in 2010 did make some agreements to at least uh, start to protect certain portions. So they had this 17% land, 10% of the ocean. And then there were some more aggressive pushes to do this 30 by 30, which is 30% of the planet by 2030. And um, I'm glad to see that there's definitely a lot more traction on this as, uh, in January. President Joe Biden released an executive order where he actually mentioned the 30 by 30 and he made some quite uh, potentially promising statements about, you know, working with those in uh, across various stakeholders to actually get this done. So that is, of course, very promising. We need to see it happening internationally and domestically in order for it to actually be impactful and effective. And then uh, Professor Hessler also mentioned, you know, last year, President Trump lifting the protections within the marine sanctuary and again there the the guise of that was for lobstermen and you know he made the statements that it was deeply unfair to the lobstermen and he couldn't really understand why it was done but you know the economy was suffering greatly uh, obviously without considering the huge environmental impact of that on the animals and the ecosystems that live there so uh, you may or may not have seen this documentary, My Octopus Teacher. If you haven't, I really do recommend it. Uh, I'm not just being biased because I was born in Cape Town. It is actually really a beautiful story and it touches on a lot of important aspects. Um, I'm going to show a graphic image, but so this really captured the minds and hearts of a lot of people across the world about this relationship with an octopus, uh, when in fact the reality is something more like this in South Africa and specifically in Cape Town. Uh, very close to where it was filmed. And in fact, even not just octopuses, that is in fact the reality. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit now. So our predominant piece of legislation that regulates fishing, obviously there's a, a large number of different pieces of laws, but is the Marine Living Resources Act. You can see by the name that living resources is really the theme of the day. And we, of course, continue to see animals merely as resources. But again, you start to see the sustainable utilization language and that wording uh, is in international law, but specifically for this act, it comes actually from our constitution, section 24, the right to environment. The problem with that is that the way that it's been interpreted by the bodies responsible for enforcing the act um, is neither sustainable, nor does it comply with the other constitutional values and the context of which the section exists. So it's really more about exploitation uh, than sustainability. And uh, I'll give you an example now, but of course, uh, it's all about exploitation and there are other elements to it, which is ensuring fair and equitable distribution of the resources, which is obviously to tackle some of the issues that were uh, pre, uh, pre to apartheid. So it obviously has some very notable aims, but again, we're seeing the implementation of it problematically. So this octopus vulgaris was identified as one of the species for exploitation through an er experimental fishery, and it largely went under the surface until at least three whales were entangled within these operations and two of them died in the space of two weeks. So obviously there was a major, major public outcry and uh, the government responded the Department of Environmental Affairs, Forestry and Fisheries by issuing a moratorium on this fishing and then uh, underwent an, a consultation period with experts mm -hmm. And subsequent to that ended up lifting this moratorium five months later and really the restrictions that were put in place re uh, related predominantly to the fishing gear and uh, to ensure that there was no entanglements and drownings. So, uh, so there were actually no more entanglements after this and this was hailed as a huge success by the industry. Uh, but one thing I did want to highlight in all of this, and you can see just one of the headlines on the slide there, was how we talk about saving the whales. And uh, silent through all of this was, of course, the fact of the exploited species being the octopuses and how, you know, we're trying to save the whales, never mind the subject species. So as an animal lawyer, we obviously care about all animals. And uh, as Professor Hessner mentioned, there's increasing science, specifically as it, as it regards cephalopods with regards to their intelligence. They've been mentioned in the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness and of course recently passing that test and there are a number of jurisdictions across the world who are prohibiting certain uh, practices as it relates to cephalopods but in South Africa of course we are looking at exploiting them uh, for fisheries. Another example is this blue economy and this ocean economy we see also happening around the world but South Africa really has one of the ro most robust programs on the African continent called Operation Fakisa and those are four of the elements that it's 
really promoting aquaculture growth, as we already discussed, and notably the Aquaculture Bill is a new piece of legislation currently making its way through Parliament. Animal welfare is mentioned, which is promising, but really all it says is that the minister may promulgate regulations. And if we look at our Animals Protection Act, which is from 1962, the minister is yet to make any regulations as it relates to animal welfare. So it's really kind of lip service to this notion of including animal welfare in the segment, which is concerning. And then of course, promoting offshore oil and gas, marine transportation and manufacturing and coastal and marine tourism. So very, very problematic from uh, environmental animal welfare and other perspectives. But one example I wanted to touch on was sharks. It's a huge industry in South Africa for tourism, great white sharks, people come from all over the world. Uh, you could see as many as hundreds in False Bay. And over the last couple of years, there's literally been none. Um, and people have been wondering where they've all gone. And it turns out, you know, people have said it's because there's orcas there, but actually a lot of it has to do with these fishing activities and uh, specifically the loss of their food. And the government response was to put together a panel and say, well, we'll ensure that uh, there's, you know, sustainable use again. So they're not actually dealing with issues holistically and perhaps seeing how some of these issues are interconnected. But again, just trying to, to deal with one issue at a time and, and not actually sorting anything out in the context of an ecosystem. So one thing I wanted to talk about was the growth of alternatives. And you would have seen uh, for terrestrial animal agriculture, a lot of plant options available for you know, some of your favorite meat and dairies. But now it's becoming increasingly popular for seafood too. And they're not only plant-based, there's fungi-based, there's cell-based or cellular, and then there's also fermentation-based. Uh, there's a very quick kind of replication on the slide as to what that looks like. There's a huge number of products and brands that are working on this. You can pretty much get anything from tuna to fishless fish sticks to crab cakes. So yeah, I encourage you to try them if you haven't. But from a regulatory perspective, these alternatives raise a lot of interesting questions. And again, some of these we would have seen arise in the terrestrial animal uh, alternative context. A lot of it has to do with what do we name these products? Those in industry have been pushing against the use of terms such as burgers or even milk. Uh, there's been court cases, they're trying to implement legislation in different states, even at the EU level. So this is something that's becoming increasingly important. There's it actually impacts the consumer uh, as to what a product is called. So they obviously are trying to push for less attractive names of products, because um, that will determine the success of whether these products, you know, actually get bought by consumers. What do we label them? which agencies have authority to regulate them. And this was something that came up specifically with cellular agriculture in the USA. And that seems to be largely settled between the FDA and the USDA, depending on which process, uh, which stage in the process it is. And then of course, across different areas of law, it raises a number of interesting questions from consumer protection. You know, are we cons confusing consumers by calling products certain things uh, to, to food safety and constitutional law? And as uh, this is currently open for comment now, the FDA had put this out for people to provide input as to specifically seafood and cellular based agriculture to ensure that consumers are not being misled. Uh, and they refer to the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetics Act. And I've just highlighted a couple of the statements over there about the products not being allowed to be misleading or being sold under the same name of another food. And then just on the right hand side, just kind of as a comparison, these have nothing to do with uh, alternatives, but these are some of the existing labels that are being used for kind of real seafood at the moment. And then we also have this dichotomy because there's a lot of uh, cases and uh, pushback from consumers to, for example, for the use of certified humane food or something being responsibly farmed, or in fact, as I mentioned, something being sustainable. So this labeling issue is very interesting. It's something that we see in wild caught fishing as well, as much as 33% of wild caught fish are mislabeled. But I think uh, I wanted to really point out the fact that uh, compared with alternatives, you know, as a consumer being maybe confused by something being called a burger versus not a burger. In this case, there are potential actual health consequences. For example, the high content of mercury and children and pregnant women eating that, or for example, allergens and the huge amount of people that are in fact allergic to fish and fish products and seafood products. So again, uh, we need to kind of look at the intention as to why we're trying to regulate the labeling and what the vested interests are in having products labeled a certain way. 
But really to conclude, uh, again, because we have this aquatic animal law panel, is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. For all of us who work in this area, it's really a constant navigational challenge. Uh, there are so many new issues arising all the time. And of course, being very sensitive to the fact that this specifically uh, is a socioeconomic issue, which is deeply rooted in cultures and traditions. And of course, people have a lot of vested and personal interests in this. So it's a hugely complex landscape, which also makes it very exciting. And just to finish off, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that all of this, aside from the aquatic animal victims that I mentioned in the beginning, has a huge impact on humans. Uh, fishing is still the most dangerous job in the world. And of course, uh, a number of people impacted by slavery in this industry. So, and, and that doesn't even speak to the worker issues and the gender issues, racial uh, immigration issues and everything else. So this is a very, very brief snapshot of some of the things that we are navigating. And I hope it's been of interest to you. And uh, I know we've run out of time nearly. So uh, please feel free to drop us all emails. Um, oh, sorry, last thing. There's a lot of, uh, just I guess this is some positive stuff. There's a lot of good things happening to uh, these increased efforts across the world and a lot more bodies and people actually focusing efforts on this attention and specifically from our point of view, from an animal perspective, which is very exciting to us. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks everyone, uh, it was a really enlightening panel. Um, I don't think we will have time for any more questions, but thank you, Professor Hessler for um, taking good, chair, good care of the Q&A as they came in. Um, if you're interested in um, the slides at all, um, reach out to me. My email um, is in the Q&A as well. Um, but I will go ahead and end it here. <laughs>